Hey, good morning. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and it's time for another Ask Me Anything. Um, apologize, we had a little bit of a disruption with the first time. We've got a thunderstorm going on down here in Ocean Springs right now, and that's probably what kicked us off. But we're, we're going we're gonna to be good here, hopefully keep our fingers crossed. And because we had a little bit of a glitch, I, you know, let's just chat about some, some things and let people get a chance to, to come to come back in and ask questions about what's what's going on in their la landscape and garden. A couple of things I wanted to you know just give you some tips. Um, and and, for, and first one is who likes coffee in the morning? Well, this guy does. But I also like the flavored coffee creamers. And you got to be asking, okay, what does this have to do with gardening, right? Well, I just wanted to show you my, my, the current flavor I'm, I'm enjoying right now would be pebbles. How can you not like that? But this has nothing to do with coffee and coffee creamer. What it has everything to do with is saving the containers because these make great containers for fertilizer. If you're going to go out in the garden and, and fertilize a little bit, you know, you can mark right on the... Um, on the um, used container here, this is 13, 13, 13. Um, you know, Osmocote, obviously you don't have to write um, Osmocote on there. But what's so easy about this, you just open it up and, and you just, just sprinkle it out. It's way better than carrying buckets and bags around, uh, which, which, te which tend to get heavy. When we're talking about, um, you know, Containers, bags, buckets. Earlier this earlier this year, and I don't see how I'm going to do this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little weightlifting here, I guess. And I was I was showing a tip earlier on a on a daily dose support, and I hope everybody's um, following the daily dose support. You know, I like to use these these buckets are great. You know, you put fertilizer in them. The tops that you buy, the cheap tops you buy, you have to pry them off and they break and they break your fingers. Well, I found these twist off tops. And I found these at Uline um, online. I have found them recently at Home Depot has them. And they work great, but Hoisting a five-gallon bucket of fertilizer or lime or whatever around, it's hard on these old bones. So found something a little easier. I found two-gallon buckets. And again, with the with the screw off top. Makes it makes it so much easier, so much more convenient. And by getting a if you want to call it a clear white. Or, or a plane versus the ones that have the Home Depot Lowe's on them. Kate then uses her Cricut and customizes them. So all my buckets are labeled what's, what's in them. And I, I, th I think this is just a, 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 a slick little idea, you know, to have a little bit of fun in the garden. Other things to talk about, I don't know, do we, do we have anybody on here, Ellen? Can you um, look at that? Before we get into or just let me go here and not not quite sure so we we shall oh, let me go over to comments here we here we go another thing i wanted to share this morning before we got started is what do you think of this hibiscus the the um, hardy hibiscus um really pretty hey Rhonda, how you doing this morning but this one right here is a seedling of mine. I collected seeds last year, and I and I've grown. I've started to grow them out, and I'm getting all these different flower colors, leaf shapes from the one the one hardy hibiscus that I was able to collect seeds off last year. Really easy to do. You you collect the seeds, you let you let them dry down for a couple of weeks, and go ahead and plant them. And I don't know out of 20 seeds, I had five germinate, which I, th I think is pretty cool, and all five are different. So I don't really want to show any of the real cool ones I've got, 
because if I if I show them today, all of a sudden that's disclosure and the clock is running as far as introducing new plans. But it's just a really neat thing to do um, of kind of growing so growing some of your own plans. What else do I have here that we've got going? Oh, here we go. Got some questions. Oh, look at everybody. Thanks for hanging with us. Oh, and Laura, EFPC, Mega's here, Curtis is here. So EF's got a question. My tropical and hardy hibiscus leaves are, are getting eaten up with um, caterpillars. We, we see this a lot. We, we, call, we call these, I, I call them pinworms. Pardon me, it's a little, it's a little hot out here on the back porch. Um, I call them pinworms. They are really prevalent on our on our hibiscus plants, and they can really defoliate the um, leaves pr pretty quickly. And one of the things I've noticed, they kind of skeletonize them, where they kind of eat all the, the cell material, but leave kind of the cell walls and the, and the veins and the leaves. What you want to do is use a product with spinosad in it, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. Um, spinosad is an organic insecticide that's actually effective for an organic. I, I use it almost exclusively in my garden here at the Urban Nano Farm for the caterpillar pests, for the leaf miners, the, those, those, type, those types of insects. Um, it's, it's effective. You know, if you don't want to go spinosad, you could go the BT route, which is which is another bacteria. Um, BT has a effective uh, range of days of about two days because it photodegrades. The spinosad is actually a translaminar where it moves into the leaf, and when the insects chew on it, then they take they take up the the insecticide, and it has an effective date range of about 21 days, so you don't have to apply as much. Lots of companies have it. Ooh, there's some, there's some nice thunder going on. Um, lots of companies have products with spinosad in it. Um, the one I like is from Bonide, and it's Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. I just like it because the name is cool. But any of the products that have, that have spinosad in it will, will, work, will work fine. And then the other question, oh, and, yep, and he's growing hardy hibiscus from seeds. I, th I just think that that is just a fun thing to do. So let's see, we got, we got Shauna's here, Tommy's here. Oh, listen, and you're, you know, you're, 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 well, you're welcome. I mean, I, I have fun sharing what we do here at the Urban Nano Farm. Uh, and I, I like to show folks, look, I garden just like everybody else, okay? And, and, I, and, I, and I learn just like everybody else from doing different things in, in the garden. Let's see, R Rhonda's using Captain Jack's. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Um, while, we, while we don't have, oh, wait a second. Curtis, I just saw you're from Dallas, Texas. You may be the farthest person away right now. There, there may be something for you at the, at the end. Now, Meg has a, a question. I have a Meyer lemon. It does have lemons on it now, and it's in its original nursery pot. So you're probably thinking it's like probably one of those tall, maybe two-gallon or three-gallon pots, I'm, I'm, assu I'm assuming. But, but I want to put it in a bigger, nicer-looking pot. Can you do it now, or should you wait? Yeah, listen... Um, you can go ahead and do it now once you find that pot that you, that you want, Meg. Go, go ahead and, tra and transplant it. Um, the, the thing is with container plants, that growing in the container gives us that flexibility of going ahead and planting whenever because we're not disrupting the root system. Um, you know, here at the, at, at, the, at the farm here in Ocean Springs, I've shown my citrus plants. I grow those in 25 gallon containers or 15 gallon containers. 25 is probably good. Um, 15 will be will be just fine. When you do that, 
you know, don't put any, I'm just going to say, don't put any dirt in there, Meg. Um, use a good potting mix. Um, one of the things I have done with the big containers is I'll take a, a good potting mix. And since we're talking about potting mixes, um, let, let me just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to tip the, the um, camera here a second. You, you see, you see, see over here. Um, that's just a couple of products, Garden Grow and Tiger Grow. Those were developed by my good friends over at the LSU Ag Center, Dr. Ed Bush and Dr. Kiki Fontno. Um, they are good professional mixes. Tiger Grow is a good container mix. Garden Grow is a good raised bed mix. Um, and I like to use those because they're manufactured right here in Mississippi at Phillips Park in uh, Brookhaven. So, you know, we talk about, you know, buying local. Yeah. We can buy local potting mix made here in Mississippi. So why, why, not, why not support them? Um, but what I would do, Meg, is take a good professional potting mix and mix it with a pine bark chip. You know, uh, some, some of the pine bark chips we get at our independent garden centers, not the pine fines, not the uh, soil, you know, the soil enhancers, but, the, but more of the bark chips that are used as mulch. And what that'll do is that'll increase the air porosity in that big pot for you. And your Meyer lemon will appreciate that. And it'll take longer for that mix, that organic mix to break down. So before you have to do anything else to it. So that that would be one one piece of advice I would have I would have for you with that. And let's see here, where are we? Where are we at in the? Um, Curtis has a zone eight A, and I'm looking for a dense evergreen for a dappled shade area. Anything over six foot tall. I'm trying to block a neighbor. Yeah, yeah. We you know sometimes we have those neighbors where we need that um, that that instant that instant fence in there. Uh, dappled shade, oh boy, it's going to be tough. You know, you'll be steered towards something like Leyland Cypress. And, and Leyland Cypress is fine. Just don't make it all Leyland Cypress. Um, Leyland, after a period of time, especially when you have a lot of them planted, you'll, we're, we're seeing some die back a little bit after 10, 15 years. Um, you could, you could go with, um, like the um, eastern red cedar, it's native. Um, as far as getting big plants, that's where you're going to have to do your homework and go to independent gardens. Don't go Lowe's, Home Depot. They they won't service you, but the independent garden centers will. And you can go there, go go to the favorite one in your area, and tell them what you're looking for. And most of the time, they'll help source the material for you from the growers themselves. So that would be that would be my 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 advice for that, Curtis. So, and then Kevin Allen, good morning, sir. How you doing today? Okay, so now Diane Harris, how are you doing this morning? It's been been a, been a while since we've seen you. So now Gene Crane, why? Why? How to fix wilting in tomatoes in North Mississippi? Need a little bit more information, Gene. Are, are these tomatoes that have suddenly wilted? Or are, are these tomatoes that have kind of just kind of declined and are wilting due just to, just to weather conditions? If, if it's sudden wilting, it's probably more of a bacterial wilt. Um, and there, there's really no fixing to that. There, there's really just, you have to rotate the tomatoes to different spots. That, that's, where, that's where we see a lot of the, uh, the wilting that, that's going on in tomatoes. It's playing tomato after tomato after tomato in the same spot. Also, Gene, are these in the in ground or in containers? So if you could give me some more information, I may be able to help you a little bit more with that. And then Dale's got a... Question, I'm noticing some yellow veining on my gardenias and my hydrangeas. Would it be safe to add iron at this time? I've never used it before. Well, 
it could be an iron issue, Dale. It could be, it could be something else. Um, with a lot of rainfall with gardenias, if the root system gets oversaturated, let's say, then it, it could be an iron issue. You, you, you're, you could be on the right track. But iron becomes, av becomes unavailable in these situations where there's a lot of soil moisture, a lot of root zone moisture. So just adding more iron isn't necessarily the, the issue. Um, to tell you the truth, what I would do is I would take a soil sample to your county extension office and get a sample done. It could also be a pH issue. And one of the things um, that I caution home gardeners about is just going ahead and we see these symptoms and just think, well, it's got to be this. And it may not be this. It could be that. Um, but the eight bucks for the soil test will give you a lot of information and then you can make a more informed decision. It could just be a nitrogen deficiency, but, but we don't, but we don't know that. So that, that's, that would be what my um, advice would be though. Go ahead and do that. Now here now, Laura, it, now she's in zone 8A and, I, and I've lost your question. There we go. What kind of sun do peonies like? And is there any truth to the idea that dumping ice on them in the winter can trick them into thinking they're getting enough cold since we don't really get enough freezing weather for them? Okay, so now my experience with peonies is full sun. Um, haven't seen many peonies um, since we've moved to Mississippi, you know, co coastal region especially. You know, once we get to northern Mississippi, we'll, we'll see more um, – see more peonies. Um, and so I would just say the full sun situation. Now, the other question about dumping ice on them to make them think that they're in the winter to kind of trick them, I really don't think that'll work. I, I, I think that you couldn't dump enough ice on those plants to, to trick them because you're going to have to cool your, your entire soil profile for it, for that, you know, that, that's a, that's an urban legend that um, Augusta national, the golf course where the masters is played that in years where they were trying to hold the azalea bloom back because they were blooming too soon, that they would just load ice trucks up and put piles of ice out in the, out in the, um, the landscape beds to try and slow the azalea, uh, azalea flowering down. I, I just, I just don't look, you could try it. Okay. I'm not saying it won't work. I just don't, I just don't think you can make or buy enough ice to do that. So interesting idea though. So now Rhonda, <laughs> yeah, we're getting almost daily rain. Some one to two inches every few days, zone eight central. Okay. I fertilize with Jacobs organic for annuals and perennials. Do I need to fertilize more than normal since the rain is flushing the fertilizer through the soil so quickly? Okay, so there, there are a couple, couple, couple of things here, Rhonda. Yeah, I know we have gotten a lot of rain here in Mississippi. Here in Ocean Springs, we have collected in our rain gauge 68 inches already this year. Um, our normal rainfall for Ocean Springs is 64. You know, look, we've got five and a half, more, five and a half months more to go. So I, I think we're going to be dealing with, um, with, with this um, soil moisture issue. Um, as, as far as applying more organic fertilizer, if you were using um, something like an Osmocote, uh, an, an inorganic or a, or a granular inorganic ag grade, I'd say probably it wouldn't hurt to add more because you as you add water to, to that system, the, the inorganic fertilizers are going to solubilize quicker and they're, go, and they're going to leave the soil profile. Um, the, um, the, the Jacobs Organic, now that particular one I'm not familiar with. I've never used it. But many of our organic formulations require 
microbial action along with heat and along with moisture. And I would guess that that's not releasing uh, nutrients as fast as an inorganic. They're, they're just they're just more mm-hmm. steps that have to happen for it for it to for it to release. Now, would it hurt? No, wouldn't wouldn't hurt at all. But I, I'm not I'm not sure that that you need that you need to do it. Okay, so I, I just leave that just leave that up to you. Okay, so Curtis, you are welcome, sir. Okay, so Jean got back to us. Her tomatoes are in the ground and sudden wilt. You know, Jean, in that case, what really is happening here? That's going to be a, that's going to be a bacterial wilt. And if you're if you've been planting in the same spot year after year after year with the tomatoes, you can build up that inoculum, that population of the bacteria that can, that can cause, that can cause the issue. Um, I would, I would go ahead and plants that are suddenly wilting. I just go ahead and pull them. Um, and then consider growing in a different location or let me, let me give you another idea of growing your tomatoes in containers using a peat based mix. Um, and, and I'll tell you why I say that. I'm a committed container grower. Um, I, I grow everything in containers. If, if you watch our daily doses, again, there's another shameless plug for our daily doses of pork. Um, if you watch our daily doses, I grow everything in containers. And I use peat-based potting mixes. As far as tomatoes go, um, I like to grow them in earth boxes. I have been growing tomatoes two crops a year for 13 years, tomatoes after tomatoes after tomatoes after tomatoes, and have never had a bacterial will, even though I'm growing in the same container year after year after year. And it's because that peat-based potting mix is really inhospitable to those, um, those bacterial organisms that cause our will issues. Um, I'll, have, I'll, I'll give more tips on that, but that's just something to think about for next year. Or, Gene, you know, there's still time to get some tomato transplants and, you know, grow a quick, you know, fall crop here in Mississippi. It's one of the nice things that we, that we can do here to tomato season. So hope that helps you with that. Now, Deidre's got a – okay, where, 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 are you, where are you, Deidre? There, there you go. I'm trying to grow tomatillas. And the leaves are starting to wilt. Closer look at the stems, totally hollow. What causes that? Okay, bug, lack of nutrients. Tomatillos, in, in my experience, okay, you know, you think that they're going to be like tomatoes, but in my experience, I have seen that hollow stem before. And I think that that's just a, a, um, an attribute of, of that plant. You know, if they're starting to wilt, I'm kind of thinking that we're, that we're looking at environmental issues. Um, I, I'll tell you what, let, let, let us know where you're at, and that may help. But I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of thinking that, that it's more environmental. And, and if that's the case, you know, there's really not much we can do about our outside environment. So let, let us know where you're at, and we'll, we'll, we'll take another stab at it. Okay, so Curtis is back. Can you talk about your process of collecting and preparing and sowing the hardy hibiscus seeds? Sure. Uh, let me see if I got an old bud on here. And I don't. I don't have an old bud, but okay. Well, let, let, let's just, let's just go ahead and have a little bit of an, of a, an anatomy lesson here. Okay. So let's just pull pull the pull these leaves back. Air leaves, right? Petals come on here. Ooh, there, there's a there's a big thunder boomer. But when we when we look when we look at this, we see the the, the, cent, the central structures here on this on, on this flower, and the 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 lower part here where, where we see it's kind of stubbly. That's where all the um, the stamens where where the where the pollen's at. And then this structure right up at the front where there's the five little pads, so that's the pistol. And the, the pollen is deposited on the pistol 
to, uh, to, to pollinate the flower. What we want to do, um, I nev I've tried, I've never had any luck hand pollinating these. Um, maybe if I try, you know, try it again, I'd, I'd have better luck. But, but we could go ahead and try to pollinate. And maybe some of the problems I've had is I've only had one. Hang on a second here. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my, my, my flower. I've only ever had one variety and I've tried to self-pollinate it. Maybe the hardy hibiscus, you can't self-pollinate. You need another plant. Um, but what you want to do is you want to wait for the flowers to fade and decline. And then what, what you'll look for is look for the seed pod that forms. And once you see that the seed pod is formed, you have to leave it on the plant until it starts to dry, until it starts to turn brown and where it's dry. And that gives you an indication that the seeds are, are ripe. And what, what, I, what I've done this past year is just collect the seeds, put them on a paper, on a paper plate, same way that um, collected and dried the tomato seeds, if you're watching our daily doses, where I showed you how collecting the tomato seeds and drying them down before, before storing them. And let, let, those, let those dry down. I do it, you know, seven, 10 days, and then just go ahead and replant those. And I do that, I do that all inside on my germination rack, just because I, I can control the environment that way. And, you know, see, see what happens with that. I mean, I don't, I don't do anything fancy with it. Um, it's, it's all kind of kitchen chemistry stuff, but go ahead and try that, see if, if, if that helps. Okay, so now we've got Rhonda's back. Okay, Job's fertilizer, right? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say the same thing. Um, I, I don't think that the nutrients are going to be rapidly depleted out of that. Um, I, I, think, I think you'll be fine. But if you want to add, add some more, go, go, ahead, go ahead and add some more. Now we've got Dean has got, what do I use to trellis for tomatoes and cucumbers in the earth boxes? What I use, Dean, is, and, and, I've, and I've tried to, all totally different, different methods of doing this. For the tomatoes, I use cattle panels. I get those from um, Tractor Supply, and they're just, they're just set on the long end, and they're you know, four foot high, and I just tie the, tie the tomatoes up to that to hold it up. The um, cucumbers... I use the trellis kits that come from Earthbox. Now, the trellis kits, I mean, they're, they're slick. They're made for the Earthbox. They work really well. But with the kits, they, they come with a kind of a string trellis that lasts you one season. I went ahead with that, and I got some, oh, I'm going to say um, chicken wire hardware cloth, like three-inch three inch by two-inch openings. And I, and I attach that onto the um, earth box trellis so it, it's something solid and just, just let the, um, the cucumbers crawl and um, hang out on that. that that's, what, that's what I did. I just adapted what earth box has. Okay, so now Wanda is my, my lawn is turning brown in patches. Now, I will tell you, Rhonda, with, with this, how about sending me an email Southern Gardening at msstate.edu with pictures of your lawn. That would really help me out a lot. But I'm I'm going to give you I'm going to give you some 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 of my thoughts here. Lawn care company us is this a current lawn care company or somebody that you've had come in and look at it? it? Has told me I have a fungus due to too much rain. Yeah. How can this be if it's only in patches and no other person in the neighborhood is having this problem? We're getting all the same kind of rain. Okay. Yeah, here, here's where I, I, do, I do need the picture. I do need some more information. Like what kind of grass you have, you know, how you're cutting it. Because um, St. Augustine and centipede grass will, will get these patch funguses. And they're called brown patch. And they start off small and they, and they, work, and they work out from a center point. Yeah. And so you can have the you can have these patches in your lawn. It's a little unusual to have those now. 
we tend to see those patch diseases kind of on the shoulder seasons when it's starting to warm up in the springtime and when it's starting to cool down in the fall, but we have a lot of rain. We, when we get these, these temperature zones, I'm going to say in the 60 or the 50, 70 during the day, though it may, it may be a little, little, you know, little off either way on temperature wise. But when we get those, those moderating temperatures, we start seeing these patch diseases. And once you get them, there's not a lot that you can do to cure it. You can stop the progression, but you can't repair the damage that's already done. And so in the spring and fall, we'll recommend putting a contact fun lawn fungicide, chlorothalonil is, is one, there are others, out ahead of the conditions where these, where these, where these um, fungal pathogens will grow. Um, if you've got something like St. Augustine now in the summertime with all this rain, you could have something that's called St. Augustine decline, and that's bad. Um, it's, it's actually a, a pathogen that we, fungal pathogen that we can't cure. We can suppress it, but we can't cure it because it's a combination of too much water, which, you know, we, we can't do much about it with the rain and too much fertilizer. And sometimes when we over fertilize, we run into problems too. So send, send me some more information to that email and, I, and I'll, I'll be able to get you, some, get you some, some better info to help you with that. So if you'll do that, that that'll, that'll work great. Now, Rhonda, love the earth boxes. This year's tomatoes had no wilt, fungus, bugs, blossom, end rot. Hey, listen, send me some pictures of that. Um, I think the earth box growing system is, is the way to go. You know, my background is greenhouse nursery production. I, I can grow just about anything in a pot. And I have 136 earth boxes here at the house. I, I'm, a firm I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, my tomatoes, I pulled my tomatoes out over 4th of July weekend. And I've, I've got my new ones sown that we'll plant next month. And I, I'll Keep everybody up to date on that with the daily go support. Okay, so let's let's see what else we got. Deidre is in Clinton, and I and I and I've already forgot what your question was. Trying to go tell Matias. Um, I'll tell you, Deidre, give. Have you had any success? If so, what tips? Um, as far as success with Tomatias growing in the earth box is treating just like I did the tomatoes and everything else. Tell you what, give the um, truck crops branch station in Crystal Springs a call. Um, they, they, have, they have a couple of great vegetable folks there that maybe they can give you some better information than I can. Just, that's just, look, it's just another source of information for you. But the truck crops down, down at Crystal Springs and see if you can get, get some advice on that. Okay, so Robin, do I have a second growth of bell peppers or do I pull up and replant like the tomatoes? Well, Robin, all of my peppers, I treat different than the tomatoes. My tomatoes, I always, I'm shooting to plant April 5th. That's our frost date here on the coast. And then pull July because they're not producing in the summertime, replant in August. The peppers, I don't plant at least until May 1st or even May 15th because what I found that early pepper plants don't like the, the um, root zone temperatures. Even in the earth boxes, it's a little cooler than they like. And years ago, I, I, did, a, I did a comparison study where I planted some with the tomatoes and I waited to May 15th to plant a second batch, and you want to know something? They all fruited at the same time. The peppers just like hotter weather. And my peppers right now are just going gangbusters. We just did a daily dose showing the pepper plants, and they will continue to grow now all the way through the fall. So peppers, I, I, don't, I don't replant. I think if, you're, if your peppers are running out of gas, it may have been planted a little early. Give them another shot of fertilizer, maybe maybe even prune them back by half. Let them push some more new growth, 
and and keep right on going. But I would I wouldn't replant. And oh, and can, can I grow fall purple hull peas in central Mississippi? If so, is there a time to plant? I'm going to say, Owen, you could try. I've never grown purple hulls. That is just something that is just not in my wheelhouse. You know, but I'm always saying, look, if you want to try it, try it and, and, and see what happens. I like planting things kind of off the traditional planting schedule. So maybe you can have some success with it. Um, it listen, if, if you'll send me an email at that uh, southerngardeningmsstate.edu with that, I'll get I'll get you a better a better answer to that. But that that's just you know if you want to go ahead. That's my quick answer for that. Now Curtis, okay, yeah, this is funny. I promise not to ask any more questions. Now you can you can ask, you can ask all all all, the, all that you want. Okay, I'm talking about containers. Have you ever tried the bottomless container method for permanent placement in the garden? I'm looking to add height in the middle of a garden bin. Came across this idea. I just don't know what the pros and cons. I read you can plant shrubs and ornamental trees in this method. Um, yeah, you know the bottomless pots. I have I have seen that. And I think if you wanted to do that with shrubs and trees, I don't, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. It goes along with the idea that folks had. Oh, I'm trying, I'm trying to think. Re research some friends of mine were doing, like in the middle '90s, of actually taking trees and shrubs, you know, and in effect trying to raise them up out of the ground, but by taking them like out of the pots, setting them right on top of the ground and then mulching and building the landscape beds up around them that way. Um, I like that idea rather than keeping that pot as as area for the roots. Um, I, I think I think you would get I think you'd get better growth in the long run if you if you did something that you know to get that pot out of there unless that's kind of the look that you wanted. And, and if that's the case, um, I wouldn't go the bottomless pot. I would just go big pots sitting on top of the ground. And that, that's how I grow everything here. I have, I have no landscape plants. I have nothing in ground. I do have a little free garden up on my sidewalk. That's a raised bed, but that's the only thing I have in the ground. So if you want to try that, go for it. I, I, don't, I don't think it'll hurt you. I think you'll get better. I think you'll have better success with some of the suggestions that I've had, but keep asking those questions. Oh, hi, who, 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 we're going 38 minutes here. Um, got a couple of other things that I, ha that I had on my, um, on my to-do list here. One of them is we were talking about tomatoes a little bit. And you know, I, I like I like to do the giveaways on this on, on this. Um, ask, ask me anything. And so I've got I've got a really cool giveaway here. Looking at the at, from the tomato standpoint, I want to know. Put in the comments what your favorite tomato variety is that you want to that you would like to grow. Um, you know, I've told everybody in the past. You know, I don't really like fresh tomatoes. It's it's a it's a, te it's a texture thing. But I do like to grow a lot of tomatoes. And one that, that I started growing last year, and this is a Mississippi medallion plant, but from proven winners, it's Garden Gem. This was developed down at University of Florida. It is, it is a fantastic tomato. It has done very well here in my garden the last two years, the last year I did spring and fall. Um, I'm going to do, I've done them already in the spring. I'm going to do them again in the fall. But it's, it's a semi-determinant, so it's not going to just continue to grow and, and cause some ripening issues this fall. But garden, garden gem. And I'll, I'll pick a, ra a random comment and send, you know, contact you and then, then send these out. It, it's funny. I did a southern gardening uh, column earlier this year talking about 
the Mississippi Medallion tomato varieties. And everybody wanted to know, how, how can we get Garden Gem? And so I send them, send them the information. And you can only buy these from proven winners. And everybody's big hang up on it was, well, they're eight bucks a pack. There's only 15 seeds. And I, I look at that thinking, you know, you know are you going to buy a cheaper pack of seeds and plant 40 tomato plants? I, you know, probably not. You know, th this is, this is, you know, even if you buy it, and not win it this, this week, this is, this is a great tomato to try. So anyways, what's your favorite tomato? And we've all, oh, we've already got people want, want the, the garden gems. We've got the Marion pineapple tomato, Never grown the pineapple. I've grown a lot. I've grown a hundred different heirloom tomatoes here looking for tomatoes that will grow here in the, in the deep south. Big beef, black creme, better boy, sweet 100. Again, Marion, black cherry, 4th of July. Sharon, isn't 4th of July a fun tomato to grow? Um, I got turned on to that one by my friend Ron Wilson. He has a national radio show every Saturday morning. It's in the garden with Ron Wilson. And 4th of July is his favorite tomato. Well, I, I call him and I kid him about it, that we grow 4th of July, but we need here in Ocean Springs, we need to call them the 4th of June because that's when they ripen for us versus 4th of July in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. So that's, 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 in, that's interesting. Let's see, Cherokee Purple is great. Creole is great. Um, now, Meg, I don't eat tomatoes either. Husband is tomato tester, and and he just last night tried a new tomato I grew for the first time. He says Black Beauty, great one. Celebrity is good. Granny Smith tomato, I've never heard of that one. We may have to, we may have to try try that out. Heat Master, oh yeah, Heat Masters, uh, th those type of tomatoes, the Creole, an old one that we grow here that an oldie but a goodie it's homestead that was developed at university of florida in the 1950s and it gets zero leaf spot leaf disease on it here in our environment where others just are defoliated and okay yeah fourth of july so yeah so listen i think this i think this is all great and i appreciate everybody hanging in here with us asking all these questions I, I am going to give you one more tip before before I go ahead and and, um, and sign off for today. Um, on a daily dose, so Fourth of July, I went ahead and I planted my fall tomatoes, and I started using this technique of not planting one tomato in a pot, but doing these dense plantings in a in a container and then separating them out and transplanting into their final um, final transplanting container. I got this from Joe Lample, Joe Gardner podcast. If you, if you haven't seen Joe Lample, check him out, Growing a Greener World. But sowed these on, fourth, on actually July 5th, and today is the 16th. So now this 11 days, look, look at this. Germinate them in on my rack, um, 80 degree um, bottom heat. Boom, they were up. Now, one of the things I, I'll get a question on is how, how do you water this kind of this kind of growing arrangement? Because if you water from the top, you're just going to knock, knock all these seedlings down. Well, take one of these little lab bottles, you know, little squirt bottles. And this one, I do a little bit of a, a um, dilute miracle Grow solution. But you can go ahead and, you know, can, can you see how I'm able to squirt that in there? And I can I can go I can go ahead and water this pot without disturbing the little seedlings right now. I think it's, I think this is a really neat idea, especially any any of your indoor plants. It's a way a way to efficiently water. So with that, you know I didn't even get to all the questions I had on here, which is good. I'll I'll just go ahead and save them for next time. Okay, if that if that's fine with everybody. Yeah, Sharon, yeah, Growing a Greener World is, is a great show. I mean, you just get some great information from them. So with that, listen, I'm just going to say thanks for joining us this morning. 
So if you got any questions that I didn't answer live, go ahead, put them in the comments or email them to me, southerngardening at msstate.edu. And, you know, that's a great way to get a hold of me. Uh, go ahead, keep following us on Facebook, Southern Gardening, Instagram, Southern Gardening. Share us with your friends. Be sure to watch, you know, daily. I, I'd say our daily dose of pork. I don't do daily ones anymore, but we're here for a week and see what's going on here at the Urban Nano Park. So with that, thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. And look, we'll see you next time for uh, Southern Gardening. Ask me anything.